I'm going to be talking about relatively isolated systems as uh, defined by Ingarden and comparing Ingarden's account of systems with a physics-based account of systems and uh, ending with a problem which I believe applies to both of those accounts. I was studying maths and philosophy in Oxford and um, I, I was already then a contrarian, so I was looking for an alternative to uh, Oxford analytic philosophy, which I found much too polite. And um, I also had a vague uh, idea that when I had finished my undergraduate work in Oxford, I would write a PhD on the aesthetics of mathematics. And my problem was that I didn't know anything really about aesthetics, but I also couldn't find any avenue or any doorway into aesthetics which would be appropriately technical and mathematical. And by accident, I, I encountered time and modes of being in the Bodleian Library. I was browsing the shelves at random, and it sounded as if it might have a, a, an interesting uh, content. And so I opened it to a page where there was a schema. Time and modes of being, incidentally, is a a translation of parts of uh, the controversy over the existence of the world, volume one, into English. Uh, it was only in the last years that the, the, the whole of volumes one and two finally appeared in English. But anyway, I saw this scheme of different modes and moments of being, and I realized immediately that, that this was the, the um, methodology of philosophy I wanted to apply, and Simultaneously, I realized that Ingarden had contributed to the field of aesthetics. And so my life was then doomed to follow an Ingardenian approach to ontology. I then went to Manchester, still with the plan of writing a dissertation on the aesthetics of mathematics, but now armed with Ingarden's ideas. And I gradually moved away from uh, aesthetics and more and more in the direction of ontology. And um, so when I returned to Manchester after a, a period as a postdoc uh, working on uh, ontological ideas, I, um, I became involved with uh, a group of people who were um, in part engaged in publishing Ingarden's works. And I can say that I was responsible for the title of Ingarden's collection, Man and Value. Um, I, I didn't actually contribute to the translation, but I contributed the title. And um, I was also occasionally interacting with uh, our Polish colleagues, including attending a meeting. The first international meeting I ever attended, which was a meeting on the fifth anniversary of Ingarden's death, uh, which also changed my life in many uh, respects. Um, uh, th it was this meeting which eventually led me to spend some time in Liechtenstein, for instance. Then I went to Buffalo, still working on Ingarden, working on Ingarden's formal and material and existential ontology. Um, and then I, I uh, had a time out from Buffalo when I spent four years in Germany, at least partly in Germany, working on formal ontology and medical information science. And during this period, Basic Formal Ontology was first released. Now, Basic Formal Ontology is a formal ontology in two senses. First of all, it has formal axioms and formal definitions of all the terms. But secondly, it's also formal in the sense first defined by Husserl and then adopted by Ingarden. That is to say, it's an ontology of the formal, highly general structures of reality. And uh, so BFO is now a very successful ontology instrument. It's used by hundreds, literally hundreds of groups in uh, many disciplines, mainly biology and medicine, but now also in the military, in the intelligence community, in industry, uh, in ecology and um, in, in, in uh, other areas. And... Um, one of the, one of the uh, first um, results of my work on the ontology of medicine was this paper, which is about the ontology of the embryo and about the question, when does the human 
being first begin to exist. And this will be relevant to what follows, because in this paper, uh, we use Ingarden's theory of relatively isolated systems in order to understand the relation between the mother and the, um, the fetus embryo uh, 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 inside the mother, not part of the mother, but inside the mother. We also use Ingarden's theory of relatively isolated systems in our ontology of functional anatomy. And um, this is the uh, textbook on BFO that we published a couple of years ago. And the most important feature of basic formal ontology uh, and, and something which I hope will change philosophy for the future in a big way is that basic formal ontology is the first piece of philosophy to become an international standard. So ISO is the International Standards Organization. IEC is the International Electrotechnical Commission, which is responsible for ensuring that all your plugs fit into all your sockets. And BFO is a bit like that. It's a, an ontology which is designed to ensure that all the ontologies that people build in the future will fit together because they have this a uh, very, very simple and very, very small set of sockets called basic formal ontology, which they all should be sharing. All right, so let's talk about relatively isolated systems. In Garden's idea is that everything in the world is an isolated system, very roughly speaking, and then there are gaps between them, and some of those gaps serve, uh, they contribute to the isolation. And uh, isolated systems can be shielded uh, or they can be separated by mechanisms of various sorts. And um, so uh, a, an organism is a relatively isolated system, which is shielded by the skin or hide, which is also a relatively isolated system uh, composed of many layers and forming the boundary between the body and the external world. So the, the, the skin is a permeable membrane. What, what Ingard means by relatively isolated is that there are still some ways in which there can be communication between the interior of the relatively isolated system and its exterior. Now, a man called Gladden published a paper on Ingarden's uh, systems theoretical approach, and he has some diagrams which I think are quite illuminating, although we, we, we will see that there may be problems with these di di uh, diagrams later on. But this is the idea. There are lots of relatively isolated systems which communicate with each other. No system is completely closed. No system is completely open. And then there is some empty space left over. And uh, I think what both Ingarden and Gladden perhaps neglect is that many systems are linked so you can't see linkages here. You can see communication channels, but you don't see any pipes or conduits or veins or arteries connecting the systems together. And that those conduits will be very important for what follows. So this is how the body looks inside. You see that there are systems, but then there are all kinds of pipes and connections connecting the, the, the systems with each other. And these are described in the uh, paper 16 days, which I already referred to. 16 days refers to the fact that 16 days after fertilization is the point in time where a human individual begins to exist, according to our ontological analysis. And you can see that there is a, a tube here which plays a very important role in connecting two systems, two non-overlapping systems, uh, one of which is in the interior of the other, but not a part of the other. All right, so Ingarden points out that the human being is a relatively isolated system, which has lots of systems inside it, uh, uh, hierarchically organized. And he gives lists of these systems in um, man and value. So this is one example of uh, a system, a highest order subsystem of the human being uh, with partial systems as follows. And all of these partial systems, it's important to note, are physical systems. They produce antibodies. 
They expel foreign bodies and so on. There are systems for all of these things. And then he has an information system, which is another subsystem of the human organism. And here too, I believe, although it's not quite clear, all of the subsystems that Ingarden lists are physical systems with physical outputs and physical inputs. This is even true of the language system. Um, the language system is a system which is part of the brain and which steers other parts of the body, for instance, the lungs, which provide air, and the tongue and teeth, which shape that air as it is uh, pushed out of our mouths by uh, the organism, the human organism, in a uh, uh, process of speaking. Now, remember Gladden's diagram. We have all of these. They look a bit like coronaviruses spreading around the world, um, as if they're all separate. But this is the circulatory system, and this is the nervous system inside the human being. These two systems are not separate from each other. They massively overlap and have massively large number, numbers of interconnecting points, areas where chemical communication takes place or sometimes physical communication takes place between one system and another. So the way in which the world is divided into relatively isolated systems is not capable, capable of being represented on a simple map with circles inside it. And everyone knows that, Ingarden knows that, Gladden knows that, but we need to uh, keep it in mind as we go along. And now, most of the literature on Ingarden's theory of relatively isolated systems has related to uh, the idea that there is a system which is responsible for things like responsibility and consciousness. Uh, now, Ingarden does talk about three regions of the human being. Um, the, the body, uh, which consists of two systems, the sustenance system and the reproductive system. And we saw some of the subsystems of the sustenance system earlier. And then the ego with the stream of experiences and then the psyche, the ich, the I or the ego. And w one question I have is, can these three regions of the human being be conceived as elements of a single system or as subsystems within a single system or do we need to consider them as regions rather than as systems or elements at all that's a question which i'm not sure about certainly many of the diagrams as we shall see in gladden once again conceive them as subsystems but i'm just not sure that that is a correct account so this is gladden's diagram uh, we have the physical body and then inside the physical body is the soul, uh, the geist, the spirit, the mind, whatever we call it. And then inside that is the ich, the ego, uh, the I of conscious awareness. I don't know whether that is a correct account. But in any case, everything inside the physical body is physical, isn't it? And so if it is a correct account, then that means that the I is physical. All right. Uh, so we've already seen that. There are barriers or boundaries around relatively isolated systems. They, these can be either skins or membranes, or they can be mechanisms. And Gladden talks about sleep as a mechanism to block the, ich, the ego from receiving sense impressions. And I'm not, uh, he gives us as a citation this, this work by Ingarden, which I can't read. Uh, maybe Peter Simons can read it for me. Um, I'm just not sure whether this is a, a, a good enough reason to believe that the, uh, the ich is a system of the relatively isolated sort. This, this thesis that it is a relatively isolated sort of system is put forward by Gladden. All right, so everything here, as I said, is physical, including the language system. And we talked a lot about neutralizers, isolators. So walls and windows and sunglasses are examples of isolators. Um, sleep, maybe blindfolds, antidepressants are examples of neutralizers. So these are two different ways in which relatively isolated systems are separated from their surroundings. 
And now we're going to move from in garden to physics. Or we've been we've been in in physics all the way along. Everything that in garden talks about, I believe, can be understood as physical. But that's a, a question that we will maybe uh, deal with later on. Um, so in physics, systems are viewed for obvious reasons from a very mathematical point of view in terms of measurable quantities or properties or attributes of what they call elements. And a system is a, a totality. It's an aggregate of elements which are dynamically interrelated and which have a certain delimited behavior. And what it means to delimit is something like this. We select a level of granularity of elements. Uh, so we may look at the entire universe as an aggregate of microphysical particles, which is what it is in the end, uh, with gaps between them. Um, or we may look at, look at the entire universe as a collection of galaxies. And both of those are systems. They're two different systems, both of which stretch virtually across the entire universe. And we can choose systems which are much smaller than the entire universe, such as the system of all people or the system which is made up of the people at this meeting who are connect connected to another system, which is the Zoom system, which we may get back to later on. Um, and now elements are objects interacting inside a system and systems will, will almost certainly have different types of elements and all elements are physical. That is the physics point of view. So. These systems, as viewed by the physicist, are not chunks of matter. They're not like oceans. They're, they're more like sets. They're more, they, they are, in some sense, ag abstract. I don't want to go into the business of worrying about the nature of this abstraction, um, although we may come back to it at the end. All right, now there are various types of systems. The solar system is obviously a type of system made up of physical elements which interact dynamically. It's the very best example of a system. Uh, the human cognitive system is made up of neuron, neurons which interact dynamically, that the elements of the human cognitive system at one granularity are neurons. And now we can view that system as a universal or as a type, uh, but we can also view the instance of that system which is inside Jan Volensky, for instance. So there is the human cognitive system of Jan Volensky, which is an instance of the type human cognitive system. And then there are artificial systems. So the New York Stock Exchange and the Milan subway system are artificial systems. And um, I'm going to be talking about those uh, in, in some detail because they're interesting ones. They are quite clearly systems in the physical sense, I believe, but they're also quite clearly not such that we can predict their behavior in the way that we can predict the behavior of the solar system by using physical laws. And uh, the one big feature of artificial systems is that their elements have capabilities. They're designed to have those capabilities. Uh, and capabilities include things like the capability to think, uh, on the part of people, of course, which was, were designed by evolution, and on the part of artifacts like computers who have the capability to compute. All right, so the Milan subway system, the elements are the tracks, trains, ticket machines, computers, employees, and passengers, and they all have their own set of capabilities. There is the nighttime system, which is very different from the daytime system, and the whole thing is changing all the time. New stations, new, new passengers, new ticket schemes, uh, and so on. So this is a big, big, ugly system, but it's going round and round every day. And we could, we can understand it physically, at least at a very, very preliminary level. We can describe it physically and we can explain how it works physically. And similarly, the New York Stock Exchange, it's a physical system. The elements are humans and computers. There are subsystems of importance here, such as the neurological systems, the greed systems, cognitive systems, and so forth. Uh, but we'll just look at the humans and the computers. So the humans have computer systems in front of them. 
and th there are messages coming to these computer systems from all over the world. They see on the screen uh, other people initiate processes of buying and selling, and everything here is physical. Um, so they place the fingertip on a key surface, press, and then electromagnetic forces trigger light waves, which trigger brain activity on the part of other human beings, which lead to events inside their brains, which lead ultimately to more buying and selling decisions and so on, round and round and round. And then at night, it's switched off, more or less, except there are lots of people awake in Japan. All right. So we have three types of system. We have solar system, which doesn't have any capabilities, which have the, we, the human cognitive system, which has mental capabilities, and then artificial systems. And the, an example of an artificial system is the Lvov Warsaw School philosophy system. And uh, the elements of the Lvov Warsaw School philosophy system are some people, a plus, some paper. They need paper. This is a device which they used to use in the olden days before we had keyboards in order to write things down. And I think I have some paper somewhere in a box. And pencils. So these are the devices which they use in order to place these uh, marks on the paper. And then there was a revolution and they, they all acquired typewriters. Later on, of course, they had printing presses, journals and so forth. But this will do as a first step. All right, so this is the elements of the law. Well, this is the system here. Now, of course, it's relatively isolated, which means it has to have communication elements. These are elements on the boundaries of the system. And, and they include, for instance, uh, the post office in Lvov, where they used to send their letters to each other in the olden days when people sent letters. And this, this uh, makes clear that systems are almost always embedded within larger systems. I think that's probably true of all systems. And so the Lvov Warsaw uh, philosophy system is embedded in the larger system, which is the history of the Lvov Warsaw School philosophy system. And you can see that one element of this system is uh, is um, young ja Jan here, young Volensky, um, who is, I, I don't really know how we can understand this old system as part of this new system, but that's a, a problem for another talk. All right, now, as I said, systems in the physical sense are in some sense fiat objects. They represent the choices by physicists to choose various elements and various parameters in order to understand the world. So we could choose different elements. Uh, uh, we might study the Lvov Warsaw School system from the point of view of the food that the peep members were eating, or we might take another cut through that particular set of people. But we choose to look at them through their publications and through their writings and so forth. Now, what this means is that systems have a granular flaw. Uh, the Milan subway trains have as parts physical particles, but we don't care about those physical particles when we're trying to understand the behavior of the subway system. And so those physical particles are not elements of the subway system. Only the trains, the tracks, the tickets, and so on are elements. Now, some systems are chaotic. And um, this means that they behave in ways governed by physical laws because everything behaves in ways governed by physical laws so that we could, in principle, predict how they behave, but we can't. And the reason that we can't is because we can't measure their starting conditions exactly. And a good example is the mushroom growth system in your forest. So mushrooms sprout seemingly at random. We can't predict where they will sprout because we can't measure the initial conditions for sprouting. And um, our measuring instruments are just not precise enough to do that. All right, now 
we've identified various complex systems. The Love Warsaw School philosophy system is a very complex system. The New York Stock Exchange is a very complex system. The mushroom in your forest system is a very complex system. This means that we can't predict how they will behave. We can perhaps describe them physically. We can pr perhaps explain their behavior physically, but we can't predict their behavior. And um, this is because complex systems have special properties, some of which we've already encountered. So I'll go through just some of these. So we saw there are quite strange combinations of element types, pieces of paper, pencils, and organisms somehow form a system, um, a, a very interesting system. And um, there are different interaction types between the elements. So on some days, the philosophers use their pencils to write marks, to leave graphite traces on these pieces of paper. On other days, when they're really angry, they, they tear the pieces of paper into tiny pieces and set fire to them. These are, these are different kinds of interactions between elements. The solar system only has one kind of interaction between its elements, namely gravity, where complex systems have multiple arbitrary changing combinations. The Relations between the element types can be different from one day to the next. The next property is force overlay. What this means is that there are forces acting at different times, forces acting at the same time. And to understand how these forces combine together, for instance, when you look at people trying to squeeze into a crowded subway train in Milan in the middle of the rush hour, that that force is combining with the force on the brain of the driver of the subway train who wants to start the train. And that in turn combines with the force on the in the mind of the inspector of the Milanway subway train system at that moment who realizes that there's going to be a delay on track B. So this is characteristic of complex systems. This is force overlay. And then we won't talk about phase spaces. We won't talk about drivenness. We will talk about evolutionary properties and non-fixable boundary conditions. Complex systems grow, but they don't grow towards e equilibrium. The lvov warsaw School started large. It became larger. Now it's quite small. Um, the Milan subway system started small and just gets bigger and bigger. But you can't really say where it stops, because if you build a new station, that whole, has all kinds of implications for building new track, building, building new buildings, new buildings being built by people who know that the new station is, is coming into existence and so on. These are called evolutionary properties. And um, the idea is that we have a system, but then there is a chance for the system to interact with its surroundings and they, it tries to interact, and that either works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, then it's killed. But if it does work, then it's selected for. That's evolution. So if the system gets selected, becomes part of this new environment and transforms it into a, a new environment, again, as, as this happens when you build a new subway station. And then new and arriving things in the future experience this new, bigger system. And then each system is deliberated by its delimited by its boundaries, which are the last element belonging to the system and the surroundings of that last element. They are what make the boundaries as it moves out, grows bigger, but it's never moving towards an equilibrium. And they have no fixed boundaries. So this is an example of a complex system that, that Ingarden talks about relatively isolated systems. This complex multimodal cyber defense system is indeed relatively isolated, but in a very complex way and with very many different kinds of channels, primarily digital, connecting its subsystems. All right, so this is a survey of some examples. So a solar system is not a complex system at all. It's a simple system. It doesn't have any of the properties. A steam engine just has one of the properties. It has an equilibrium state. And then the other examples have increasingly more of the properties. 
And every organism has all seven of the properties. And so does the Milan subway system, the New York Stock Exchange, the global climate system, and the human language system. For instance, English or Polish or the human language system of this particular meeting, which is also a system. All right, so now I'm coming to the end. So we're going to have quite a bit of time for discussion. Uh, so we have a dilemma here. And it's a dilemma which arises both for the Ingardinian view of systems as relatively isolated systems and from the physics-based view of systems as aggregates, uh, delimited aggregates of interacting elements. And I, I, I believe that those two accounts of system are in fact one and the same account, just emphasizing different examples and different goals. The goal of Ingarden was not to do mathematics. So on the one hand, it seems uh, reasonable to say that a human being, I th I'm citing this now, I didn't use the word man myself. This is from Sabina Bertolini, a paper on Ingarden. I should have uh, cited the paper on the slide. So she used the word man. Um, let, let's say a human being is an object, which is an element of a population system. But also at various points in the course of what you've just been listening to, it was stated that a human being is a system, a higher order system with various subsystems as parts. And so the dilemma is, can a system be an object? Can an object be a system? On the one hand, so certainly it's true that objects can be inside systems because they are elements of systems. But can systems be objects inside other systems, which is what would be implied if, if a human being is a system and a human being is an element of a larger system, for instance, a population system or the system which is this meeting or the Lavoff Warsaw School philosophy system. Uh, now, why is that a problem? Well, we've said already that systems have a granular flaw, they, that, which is uh, selected by the physicist in order to make it possible to carry out physical reasoning. If you want to carry out physical reasoning across the entire universe or even across an entire single neuron, you will fail because there are just too many dimensions. A single neuron has, I don't know, millions, perhaps billions of dimensions of measurable properties if you measure them physically and if you could measure them because there are so many molecules involved and each of those molecules is moving, emitting chemicals, has electric properties and so forth. Each of those will be multidimensional and because you have so many molecules, you have corresponding billions or trillions of dimensions of the system. You can't do physics if you have trillions of dimensions. You can probably only do physics if you have about three dimensions, or in any case, a very small number of dimensions. That's why you can't do physics in order to make money on the stock exchange, because if you could predict the stock exchange, you would be rich, and, and physicists would then stop doing physics and just, anyway. So systems as understand, but stood by the physicist have a granular flaw. There are, you can only reason over a certain simplicity of combinations of elements and combinations of dimensions. So systems are fiat objects created to enable mathematical reasoning. Now, so there are lots, so no car is a system. Every car has lots of systems inside it, but no car is a system. This is the thesis. This looks very much like an object. Uh, this is a factory in a box. A factory is a system, or anyway, factories have systems inside them, but this box is a factory, but it's not a system. It has lots of systems inside it, including one big system, which connects all the systems inside it. But that system is not the box, because the box is an object. Um, this is an object on the left. And that is a system on the right. They are two different kinds of entities. 
And so this is the, the summary of the argument. A system is a total, totality of dynamically iterated inter and so on. A system that is identical to one object would be a system with one element. And, and elements can't dynamically inter interrelate with themselves. You need at least two elements. Systems are fiat entities, and objects are bona fide entities. They exist independently of human demarcations. So that, uh, that th this is the final slide. So Gladden, I've mentioned him. I don't know if anyone uh, at the meeting is even familiar with Gladden's work on Ingarden. I would be interested to hear if they are. Um, so Gladden puts forward the thesis that even an ordinary stone is a simple, relatively isolated system. Now, I hope it will be clear that I find this questionable. Uh, his idea is that, that, I'm quoting him now, the behavior of the molecules located at the center of the stone can be influenced by environmental factors like heat or sound waves and so on. And uh, so I, I think what he says here is true, but I don't think it makes sense to say that a stone is a sim sim system because to have a system, you need to have multiple elements. And all of the examples of systems that Ingarden describes also have multiple elements. Now, Glavin cites Ingarden in making this claim about the stone, but I couldn't find any reference to stones at the places where he cites Ingarden. So if anybody knows where Ingarden deals with the topic of stones as systems, I would appreciate information about that too. And that is, that's the end. I'm going to leave you with this uh, in, in, in order that you have some time to think about the, uh, the claims that it contains. So now I will hope that you are still all of you there and that I wasn't talking to myself. Yes, thank you very much. We are uh, here, of course. And uh, I forgot to mention that uh, there is a tool uh, in Zoom uh, with, by the use of which we may react to um, the talks presented. This is this icon reactions on the tool. And now we, we may uh, react to your paper by clapping hands like that. <laughs> oh, just so can I see this sign. I have to stop <laughs> screen sharing, do I not? Yes. Yeah, if you want to see our reactions, you have to. Oh, I see. So you it. can see things that I can't see. That's interesting. Yeah. So no so one our, is clapping. So yeah, we are. We may clap our hands virtually. We may use these uh, tools. Oh, we may also laugh your talk. So. So are you? Can you say <laughs> I was bored stiff? <laughs> no such option, I think. <laughs> Fortunately. So everyone who doesn't clap was bored stiff. That's. <laughs> So oh, thank you very much for your talk. And now it's time to open the discussion. Um, you may raise your hand because I'm, I can um, see your faces. I, I see Peter Simons and Jan Wolejski would like to start the discussion. So Peter Simons, please. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Barry. Um, okay, uh, it, this may see, I thought this was going to be a, sh a small point, but I think it's probably quite a big point. Uh, in light of what you were saying at the end about objects and systems not overlapping. Um, I wonder if all systems are fiat systems. The solar system, as you say, is very simple in that its um, principal mode of interaction is gravity. Um, I'm not sure the astronomers only cite gravity. One of the things that they, they mention in connection with where the boundary of the solar system comes is um, the reach of the solar wind, <clears throat> which is the um, stream of particles that um, leave the, the sun and uh, radiate outwards. And there is a, there is a, a surface beyond, well beyond where we are, where the, the pressure of the solar wind is equal to the ambient pressure in the, re in the rest of the interstellar vacuum. Um, and when, when NASA say things like um, Viking One has left the solar system, they, they mean that it's gone beyond the place where the solar wind has more of an effect on the environment than what's going on elsewhere. So um, it, it seems as though 
there isn't much room for fiat there. It looks as though the system is something that uh, demarcates itself by physical uh, means. And, and the impact that this might have is that uh, maybe the um, distinction between objects and systems is not uh, impervious. That is, you might have something which does count as a system and as an object. I'm not saying the solar system is one such, but um, the, one of the other conditions you, you gave for distinguishing between uh, objects and, and systems was that a system consists of a plurality of objects, whereas an object is just one object. And that would still apply to the solar system, even if it's not demarcated by fiat. That's it. Good. So I, I, I agree with everything you said, except the conclusion that it would follow that the system is not a fiat system. So we have one system, which is the solar system in which there is just one interaction type. And, and nine or ten elements, which are the planets plus the sun. Then we have another system in which, which is bigger than the first system, which has further elements, uh, uh, wind particles. I don't know what how the solar wind is made up, um, but in any case, whatever it is which vehiculates the solar wind would be uh, another element. Um, and you take the the totality of the seven planets, the sun, and the solar wind elements. I have to say elements because I need particles. I need physical particles to be elements. And that's another system, also a fiat system. You could, and, and you have to determine when you add another element what the parameters will be, wh which are going to be the measurable or observable dimensions. That's another element of fiat. Now, I agree with you that the outer spatial boundary of the, uh, the the wind solar system is not fiat, but there will be other elements of fiat here. For instance, there will be very weak wind. There will be some level where our measurement instruments cannot measure any more wind. They, we will then declare by fiat that anything below this threshold of measurability is not is not there anymore. Not. We won't declare that explicitly. We will declare it implicitly by saying the boundary stops here. But of course, that's a fiat boundary. It looks, it looks as if it's determined independently of human beings, but actually it's determined dependently on the resolution of our measuring instruments. Thank you. Uh, Peter, would you like to add something? <laughs> OK, everything's clear. So now, uh, Professor Jan Wolejski. So one, one historical remark, uh, King Garden was influenced by uh, cybernetics, which is now almost completely forgotten. But in, uh, when he began to, to think about uh, such things like systems, cyber, cy uh, cybernetics was, so to speak, rehabilitated in communist countries and uh, people, some people became uh, really crazy about applications of cybernetics in everywhere, also in philosophy and ontology. And I remember from Ingarden's seminar, uh, sorry because I am probably the only one person who met him personally in this company that he quite uh, frequently uh, referred to uh, Wiener and, and, and to some polycybernetics like Henry Genesty and so on. And why? I, uh, I guess that uh, a motivation was related to Barry's last words garden was always against uh, ideas like racism that the reality is uh, a set of collection of objects for example his objections against racism uh, were of this type so for him uh, the world of systems uh, 
was something which could replace this uh, ontology, particularly popular in Poland, I mean, uh, raised and similar views uh, related to logic, for example. So he uh, uh, liked to use it. It is not accident that the third volume of, of Streit uh, uses this uh, idea of system because uh, in the first two volumes there is nothing about about that. Another uh, another influence was from psychiatry. Uh, he had a friend, a friend, a very 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 important Polish psychiatrist, Antoni Kempinski, and uh, Kempinski. Uh, he understood uh, mentality as a system. Uh, according to him, uh, mental illness must be considered as uh, in relation to uh, also, because not exclusively, of course, to other uh, subjects, other, uh, other persons, in particular therapies where systematic and in garden also quite frequently spoke about yes as, as far as i know he never he never uh, uh, elaborated his definition of system in a systematic way so for example i i, I wouldn't say like barry that language was a system for in garden the physical system, certainly not. So, so he says it was a subsystem of the uh, human organism. Yes, yes. List, he puts it on his list. I, I think the, there's a way, there's a way of understanding that that we, 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 we could agree on. So I think that the first thing to be said, and I, I'm particularly interested in your point about mental disease. So only a system can have a disease. Uh, but only a system with capabilities can have a disease. So the solar system can never be ill, uh, but a, a human can be ill and the computer can have something like a disease if it breaks. Um, the, the solar system can't break. And, uh, and it's clear that the human language system can break. Some people have speech disorders. Some people lose their cap capability to speak. Um, so there is a physical system in virtue of which we can speak. Now, whether Ingarden meant to refer to that physical system when he puts the word language on his list of subsystems of the human organism, I don't know. Maybe somebody in the audience here will know. But he does, it's the only one which is not physical if, the, if, if it is the case that, as you suggest, he didn't think it was a physical system. Mm, okay, Professor Świderski. Mm, you have to You're unmute muted. yourself. You see, yeah. you have to unmute yourself, okay? So switch on your microphone. It's on the left. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Barry. <clears throat> long time Hello, no see, long time no here. Yeah. Um, what about modes of existence? Um, in the same book, that you cite, Man and Value. I didn't know the title came from you. That's a, a bit of uh, interesting information. At the end of the text, if you remember, there are these short articles, actually the beginning of the text, short articles on man and culture, man and time, and so on. And uh, in uh, those texts, he says things about culture, for example, which might fly in the face of what you want to say about systems generally, because we could assume that culture somehow is a system, but of course it's composed of many subsystems. He says things like culture really is nothing at all. It doesn't have any kind of existence. It's sort of a, uh, a, an empty whiff of the wind, so to speak, given that he's referring in effect to his doctrine of purely intentional objects, which uh, when he's candid about it, he says they're really nothing at all. They're, they just they, they don't exist. And yet, on the other hand, you know, we invest so much time and energy, you and John Searle and Roman Ingarden and so on, in talking about institutional facts, cultural entities and so on. What do you do then in terms of modes of existence, given that you have on your list of entities or systems, the solar system, the New York subway system, the 
a Milan subway system, which presumably, although they have a kind of a physical basis, are precisely these sorts of intentional objects that make up what we call generally um, culture. And the last point in this respect is um, that the responsibility text uh, says that there is this thing really called responsibility. And we need all this paraphernalia, which you presented to us by in fact citing those lists which we find in the text on responsibility in order to say that values can be realized. And the expression values can be realized refers to a, a domain which presumably is not worldly at all, namely the existence of ideal values of some kind. Does that in any sense play into your uh, reflections about systems given that um, you seem to take a relatively naturalist physicalist position uh, across the board? So, uh, the, the, the very interesting questions. Um, so, there is a, a participant in this meeting. Uh, he asked me not to introduce him, but he's called Jobs Landgraver. Um, I, I assume he's still here. Um, he and I are writing a book at the moment on complex systems, and uh, we have a whole chapter on values. Uh, so, you're going to need to read that chapter in due course to tell us what's wrong with it. Now, my first response to you is, can you tell me the, the place where Ingarden says that in, purely intentional objects do not really exist? They are really nothing. Uh, I have the Polish edition, Książka o Człowieku. Um, I have all the editions in all the languages, including yours and German. And so okay, on. I'll, write, I'll write to you and ask you for the reference. Yeah, yeah, okay, he actually says it already in controversy. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All right, you, you need to send me the page. I, mm -hmm. I missed it. Uh, it's very important. Searle himself makes the same claim. He says, for instance, he talks about money. Yeah. And uh, in a weak point, weak moment in uh, making this social world, is that what it's called? Um, he says money is just a massive social fantasy. Now, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe them. And I don't believe that culture is just a massive social fantasy either. And part of the reason and this is something which I could have mentioned as an extension system of the Lvov Warsaw School philosophy system, is that to have capabilities among human beings, you have to have teachers, you have to have schools, you have to have training. And that it, it's in virtue of all of that, that some people were trained in logic and in mathematics and so forth. That doesn't arise by accident. It arises because there are real systems, real training systems. Culture, similarly, has real training systems, not just training systems for people to be able to write literature, for instance, but also training systems so that people can read literature. And Ingarden it, it talks a lot in uh, the, the literary work of art about how the, the world, the, the, I would say the system of critics and teachers and, and librarians and so forth, maintain the existence of the literary work of art through time by controlling the set of admissible concretizations. I'm, I'm simplifying what he does say, but there is a kind of standard concretization of the literary work at any given time, or a small number of standard alternative concretizations. And that is a necessary um, uh, feature of culture if culture is to be maintained. That's why Derrida is so evil. Um, because Derrida killed culture in, in many parts of the world, unfortunately, by denying the possibility of a, a, a received understanding of something like literary work, um, and therefore also denying the, the, the utility of teaching English, uh, English literature in a university. And so they don't teach English literature in universities anymore. Uh, they teach Derrida or Foucault or something else, French. Thank or Heidegger. Uh, thank you. We still have uh, five minutes for discussion. Are there any questions or comments? What about these stones? Do you know something about it? I'm also interested, just as um, the, um, the speaker, are there systems? Also, the, uh, Professor Alexandra Horecka. 
Thank you. I would like to ask about lab, uh, overlap in overlaps uh, of, of systems. How it's, uh, 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 what is the meaning yes, of the, the term overlap? Because uh, it's uh, some kind of coincidence yes, to, to, um, uh, to different thing in, in one place or, uh, or its um, identity of some parts of, uh, of a system, yes, some of elements. It's my first question. And the second question is, uh, uh, could it be possible that such a system is a very complex state of affairs? I mean, uh, just uh, the state of affairs, uh, affair, um, which is... Um, uh, treating uh, pendurantistic or or something like that. Uh, that that were my question. Thank you very much. So I'll do the state of affairs uh, part first. Um, syst so let, I'm just going to concentrate on systems in the physical sense. So you have elements, and then you have parameters or dimensions, or we call them qualities or properties or. Capabilities might be included there. Now, if you just look at the relation between an element and a certain parameter, then you have a state of affairs. And of course, you could have more complicated states of affairs. But in that sense, systems are made up of states of affairs. Um, and in that sense, also, you could view the system as being a collection of if you think of them as cor little coronaviruses, but where the spikes are properties. Um, I think that makes sense of the physics view of systems from a more Ingardinian uh, states of affairs oriented perspective. But it's not a big deal. It's just another fiat cut uh, to the same system world. And then with regard to overlap. So the technical term I used was overlay. And the idea is that whenever you have complex systems, then there is a certain amount of extra complexity introduced by the fact. So in the solar system, there's no force overlay. There's just one force, gravity, and nothing is competing with it. Nothing that, make, nothing that is above the level of magnitude of what we can measure is competing with gravity. But this meeting is full of force overlay. Uh, so somebody over in this corner of the screen is making rude noise, uh, sorry, is making rude gestures with his face. That really worries me. That's that's force overlay because that's that's overlaying with my force, which is to express my enthusiasm about these particular ideas. So that's force overlay. That's you find that everywhere in complex systems. Now force overlap, uh, sorry, system overlap is an interesting uh, mathematical physical question which I I don't know enough about to say something sensible. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? So let's thank once again our speaker and everyone that took uh, part in the discussion. So thank you. And thank you all. <laughs> yeah.